Thanks for joining us. We're going to be talking today on how to maximize your value using Transnetics and how exactly to be successful using our service. My name is Samira Lawton, and I'm one of the genetic resolution specialists here at Transnetics. I'm joined today by two of my teammates, David Cottle and Stephanie Sandor, who's our lead assay design expert. And our team is responsible for not only designing new assays that are introduced into our system, but also optimizing assays and troubleshooting any unexpected results you may have along the way using our service. We're going to be talking about a variety of topics today, starting with PCR versus qPCR for genotyping, the types and models of assays and um, the types of assays that we're able to run and the models that we're able to offer, different sample types we accept, how to submit a strain in our system, how to validate assays and approve strains, as well as any action items you may encounter along your way. And at the end, we'll be taking any questions that you may have. So getting started, most of us are pretty familiar with PCR as a method for genotyping. So in PCR, you rely on a band size to determine the genotype of your animals. If you have a mutant animal, so for example here, we have a model that has a knockout of exon one of a gene, what you would have is a forward and a reverse primer set that span this region of interest. So in your wild type allele, you would have the forward primer upstream of exon one, and in both of them, you would have the reverse primer downstream of exon two. And so for your wild type allele, you end up with a band size that let's say is around 500 base pairs, whereas in the mutant, this would be shorter because of the lack of exon one, so around 375 base pairs. So you'd run this PCR product out on a gel. And so what you would get is a higher band size for the wild type animals, both bands for the het, and the lower band size only for your homozygous mutant. And this is all great in theory, but a lot of the times in reality, what you end up with is a bunch of non-specific bands. And this can make results interpretation really difficult, if not impossible, or even worse, you end up with no bands at all, which makes you have to start over from the beginning. And so while PCR is great in that it's cheap and easy, it has a number of disadvantages. It's very nonspecific. And so since you're relying only on band size to determine your genotype, you may run into an issue of actually amplifying a region of DNA that you weren't trying to target in the beginning, which may confound your results interpretation. You also have to take time to optimize your protocol and PCR also has a low sensitivity. And so you have to have quite a bit of template or amplicon to actually observe a band on your gel. It also takes time. So after you run the PCR, you also have to run out the product on a gel to actually observe and interpret your results. And so it's becoming more common to use real-time PCR or qPCR for genotyping. And this is what we do here at Transnetics. We use TACMAN qPCR probes. And so in qPCR, you actually get the specificity of your reaction from a fluorescently labeled probe that falls in between your primers. So in the same case of your uh, exon one knockout animal, you would have a forward and reverse primer with a probe in exon one for your wild type animal. Whereas for your mutant, you would have a different forward and reverse primer with a probe that spans this new junction that's formed by the loss of exon one that's no longer present in the wild type animal. And what this probe looks like is it's a fluorescent dye attached to a quencher and a minor groove binder. And so the proximity of this quencher to the fluorescent dye prevents any fluorescence until this probe binds to its sequence of interest. And once it binds to the DNA, DNA polymerase can cleave the fluorescent uh, dye, and this allows for fluorescence in the well that's directly proportional to the amount of amplicon that you have present. And so the advantages of qPCR is that it's highly specific. Your exact sequence has to be present in order for you to observe a signal. It's also very sensitive. You don't need much amplicon at all in order to observe a signal. It can be automated, which is what we do here at Transnetics. There's no processing after PCR, so the PCR run itself is what you're able to use to interpret your results, and it's quantifiable. However, it does require more specialized equipment, and smaller labs or institutions that don't have those financial resources may not be able to run qPCR for standard genotyping or necessarily afford the reagents or disposables that are required for the reactions. And what we've been talking about thus far has been our singleplex assays, where you have a separate assay for your wild type allele and each of your mutant alleles. But we also offer a multiplex assay here at Transnetics, and our multiplex assays are designed to detect the presence of two alleles in the same reaction. And so we're able to use these assays when you have a short mutation, such as a SNP, or um, anything that's really less than 20 base pairs in length. 
And so we would use the same forward and reverse primers for both alleles here, but the probes would provide specificity. So you would have one probe that's designed to target the wild type allele and a second probe that's designed to detect the mutant. And this all would occur within the same well to provide us with the genotype. And so just as a summary, each reaction that we perform here at Transgenics is performed in its own well in duplicate. We run quality control checks to verify that the correct volumes have been dispensed into the well, and this is both for the amount of DNA as well as the probes themselves. While we don't directly quantify DNA concentration, we do run a housekeeping gene which allows us to normalize for the amount of DNA in each well. Those singleplex assays are normalized specifically to that housekeeping gene, whereas our multiplex assays are normalizing the wild type and mutant probes to each other, and this is what allows us to determine which alleles are present in that same well. And so now David is gonna take over and talk about the types of models that we offer here at Transetics. All right, thank you, Samira. So here's a list of the different types of models that we can genotype, and what I'm gonna do is go through how we actually target using our best practices for each of these. All right, so our first, we're gonna start with the conventional uh, knockouts and knock-ins. Um, as you can see here uh, in the wild type allele, here's your five prime arm and your three prime arm. And this green is the critical region or the area that you're trying to knock out. Um, and the way that we design our wild type is if the region is large enough, we'll place the entire assay inside of this region uh, because in the knockout, obviously this isn't present and it can't amplify. And for the knockout, the way that we make it specific is we actually place the probe directly over the new five prime, three prime arms, that new junction. Um, and this sequence isn't present in the endogenous sequence, and so it can only pick up in the knockout. And the uh, knock-ins are kind of in reverse, where for the wild type, we actually like to put our probe on the insertion point. Um, and then in the mutant assay, we will like to put one of the oligos in the endogenous sequence. We like to lay the probe across the endogenous vector junction and then the reverse in the cassette or in the case where we could, we could target down on this side as well, but it would be the same. Um, I did want to mention that for these assays, regardless of if they're knockouts or knock-ins, the probe names will always have a KO. Um, and that is just a, like a nomenclature that we use internally. So if you do have a knock-in and you see a KO, um, don't worry about that. We, we, it's just part of our, our naming system. The next type of model is conditionals. Um, and I do want to say that about 99.9% .9 of the time, if you have a conditional model, that we are going to need sequence data for it. And that is because to make these specific, we have to know exactly where these LOXP sites are introduced into your model. Um, so to, for the flox allele, these assays end in an FL. And what we typically like to do is either the five prime or three prime LOXP site, whichever one we have sequence data for, um, we will place two of, two of the three oligos on one side of the LOXP and the other, obviously on the other side. Um, that way, in the, in the instance that it's been crossed with Cree and you have this excise allele down here, um, this portion right here is no longer present and this assay can't bind and it will not function. Um, now down here for the excised allele, these will end in an EX. And the way these work is we will place same, same uh, targeting as the Floxed. However, we will place a forward and reverse uh, to span that last Lox P site. And the way that this does not pick up in the floxed allele is um, our assays are less, or 200 base pairs or less. So if this primer binds down here, this region is way too large for our assays to function and it will break and it will not work. Um, I wouldn't continue with conditionals because there are um, instances where you have these middle steps where uh, you insert a NEO or some kind of marker and then that's flanked by FRT sites and then you will cross that with flip and delete that region, but you will then have your, um, you still have your floxed allele. So in this instance, this is a, the, the top is the targeted allele, and here's your marker right here, um, surrounded by FRT sites. And tar these targeted alleles will end in a TA for targeted allele. And um, 
once you cross this to flip, this entire region is deleted. So this marker has been deleted to create this allele. And we usually end these in MD for marker deleted. And these targeting strategies are just about the same as you would see for um, a Floxed model where um, the, as you can see, the oligos down here for the marker deleted would, would fall right around here in the target allele and the forward primer would be down here. So it would be way too large to pick up. Transgenes. So there are a lot of different types of transgenes and this list could be really extensive, but we just wanted to give uh, just a quick uh, examples of the two, two of the most common ones that we get. Um, cDNA is really common. Um, with cDNA transgenes, we need to know the gene, obviously, and then the species of the transgene. And the way we target for these is pretty simple. We just place um, the probe across an exon-exon junction. And then for uh, a promoter-driven transgene, um, in this case, we did uh, villain Cree. It's really common. Um, if you, so we can use a generic Cree assay to detect this, but if you want something more specific or if you've crossed Cree lines and you need to differentiate the two, um, what we will need is we will actually need the sequence of the promoter Cree junction, which is right where, if you can see this purple, where the probe is falling on. Um, that way we can place the oligo directly on uh, the promoter Cree junction and it will be specific for your transgene. And these assays will end in a TG for transgene. Um, one other thing that I want to mention is um, zygosity for transgenes. Um, the only way that we can give zygosity for transgenes is if you know the integration site uh, into the gene. Um, randomly integrated transgene zygosity isn't something that we can do um, with this, the way that we target. So if you do know uh, where the transgene has been integrated, um, then we can definitely design a wild type to give you zygosity. Um, and then SNPs, so like Samira mentioned earlier, we use a multiplex, or we have a multiplex strategy that we use, and we use it specifically for SNPs. Um, and just to kind of reiterate what she said is we have uh, the forward and reverse primers are identical, and then the difference lays in the, um, the probes. So we have two probes, one for the wild type and one for the mutant, and they are running the same reaction and compete for binding. So the way that works is if um, only the mutant is, amplifies, we know it's a homozygote. If both amplify, it's a heterozygote. And if only the uh, wild type amplifies, then it is a wild type. And these um, results look a little different than our normal single plex. They, they come out as a plus plus, a plus minus, or a minus minus together. Um, and it's a little bit different from generic uh, scientific nomenclature in that Normally, uh, a plus plus in our system actually means a homozygous mutant. And remember, that's because we're actually detecting the presence, absence of the alleles. So um, just remember that a plus plus is a homozygous mutant if you're running a multiplex, and a minus minus is a wild type, and then a plus minus is a het. And these assays will end in an MUT or MUT. And last but not least is CRISPR. Um, so CRISPR is a gene editing tool that can be used to make any of the models that we've talked about, um, but these are treated a little bit differently. Um, we have some pretty specific guidelines that we need to be able to genotype these accurately. Um, we need these models to be characterized and in the F2 generation or later. Um, and then we also need the uh, mutated sequence. Um, and if you, when you provide the mutated sequence, if you could give us, or annotate it as best you can, if you know the guide sequences, if you know what the repair template is, um, if you could include that as well or annotate it so we can see so that we can um, use our best practices to design. Um, so the reason that we have all of these um, rules is because of mosaicism. And the way that affects our system is if the mutation isn't spread out all across the mouse robustly, um, our assays may not be able to pick it up um, robustly enough to, to accurately report a genotype. Um, if you do have a mosaic animal, there's a chance you could see what we call in our system as a UD4 or in the middle signal. So that means that the signal wasn't quite low enough to where we, it was a negative, but it wasn't robust enough to where it looked like it was a positive. Um, and we see that a lot with um, mosaic samples. And here's just a, a quick list that, you know, we, everybody knows that we genotype uh, mice and rats, but we also do zebrafish, Chinese hamster, goats, ferrets, the prairie vole, and rabbits. 
Um, if there is something on this list that you are genotyping and that we don't offer, um, feel free to reach out to us um, with your needs and we can go over that with you. And then the sample types that we accept and do not accept. So we take tissue, it's our most common form um, of sample that we collect, um, tails, ears, toes. We like, to keep, we like to keep that length around two to five millimeters. Um, we can actually take cell pellets. Uh, you can submit those in our generic transgenetics well plates. We ask that, or the best rule of thumb is if you can see a pellet, then it should be enough for us to use. Um, we can also take liquid DNA in the event that maybe your controls are only liquid DNA or you, you got it from another lab. Um, we can accept liquid DNA. However, these will have to be used or be sent in a um, specific sequencing or a liquid DNA kit that will, uh, we will send to you. It has a cooler. It will have a red plate um, and you will dispense your liquid DNA in there and send it back to us on dry ice. Um, the max volume that we can take in those is 50 microliters. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, we can take uh, paraffin embedded tissue. We just need you to deparaffinize it and make sure that the tissue is dry. Uh, we can take embryos. Um, when you send embryos, uh, don't don't put the whole embryo into the well. Uh, we only need a very small portion uh, so that our uh, robotic pipette tips can actually get down in the wells and dispense liquid and things like that. And then we can also take organs. So you can keep organs and embryos about the same size like you would send tissue. Uh, and then a quick list of things we don't accept. We don't take blood. Um, we don't take RNA, any kind of human sample. We don't do plasmids or formalin fixed tissue, bone, or any kind of infectious cells. Did you know that we actually have over 9,600 publicly available strains? You may hear a Transnex team member say, hey, just search our database, see if we have it, or hey, search our constructs. But what does the term construct actually mean? This is an internal profile that describes the genetic information about that mutation, and then it's associated to what we have our Transnex TACMAN assays for detecting the presence or absence for those corresponding alleles. So you may ask, how can you search our constructs? Well, there's three ways that you can search in your quick order account. The first is if you sign in on that front home page, you'll see this search, this search feature. If you go to My Strains, Create a New Strain, the search feature also resides there. Or if you go to the strain information form on part one, the mouse database search engine is also there. There are a few requirements. You can search the JAX ID. MGI ID or the MGI symbol to search our database. The characters must be 100% correct or you will not get a success return. So this is what you would see if you use our search feature. If you get a success return, the strain name is however you want it to populate into your account. The species um, is that drop down menu, but I do want to let you know that the species that you select, this is how we correspond your housekeeping gene and then the tissue type that you'll be sending. You'll see the probes that we'll be using to detect that mutation, along with some information regarding it um, and reference um, articles or reference URLs describing that exact same mutation. Now, I know some people or some users use our search feature because it's a similar construct. Please only use the search feature if that's the exact mutation so that we can accurately assign the correct probes for that mutation. If you don't get a return, you'll get this module along with a hyperlink to our strain information form. Now say you have a mouse that is a JAX ID, you, you use our search feature and you get this pop-up. Please don't fret, it doesn't mean that we can't assign a stock assay or design a custom assay for you, it just means we don't have a construct saved in our database yet. So if you save it in the strain information form for that database fill that I just previously showed you, we'll then be able to save it for the next user to search for that exact same mutation. So let's proceed. You didn't have a, a, a hit or a return, so you've submitted the strain information form. What we'd ask you to do is to submit the form for each constituent mutation. And what I mean is that if you have a mutation, as David and Samira suggested, maybe a targeted knockout, we'll design that knockout assay and that wild type assay for you. You do not have to submit two separate information forms per allele. We're always gonna associate that wild type as long as it's a model that we can design for. Now, we, as David suggested, we can't always design a wild type for a transgenic model unless that integration site is known where that, random, that randomly inserted transgene integrated into. Another hindrance would be 
if there is some type of homology in that wild type context sequence, or there's some type of secondary structure that prevents us from designing a, a successful TACMAN assay. So what are the golden pieces for a smooth submission? Well, number one, as we said, is a paper reference, something that actually describes the model of that mouse. Neo disrupted exon two, the SNP is that amino acid 330, that type of information, or the sequence data if you have it on hand. Now, we do allow you to upload your primer protocol or a document of that protocol, but that may not always be successful for us. We do use your primers as a reference, but as Samir and David has stated, we do not run traditional gel PCR at Transgenix. So we have to convert it to a, a custom TACMAN assay. So we'll use those as references and we can use those primers to search our own database, but it's not always the most helpful for a smooth trans, uh, submission. So if you've never been acquainted with the MGI or Jack's website, I wanted to take a snapshot for you so you can see where some of that information lives so that you can utilize our search feature. Our, the symbol would um, be at the top, the MGI ID, along with the JAX symbol or ID that you can use. Now, I do, I do wanna point out that the gene has its own name and if you click it, it has an ID. If you use that in our search feature, you're not gonna get a return. If you submit that on the strain information form, that helps us know which gene is being mutated, but that's not really what we're asking. We're asking for the ID or the symbol for the actual mutation for that gene. If you provide this mutation details, the primary uh, paper, and then I did wanna just let you recognize that this mouse strains hyperlink does show where other local databases talk about that exact same mutation as well. So that's great, you got your first strain in. So let's talk about some other cool features that are in the quick order account. Well, you've submitted your independent constituent mutations. Now you actually have a mouse that is a cross of all of those mutations. So what you can do is go to my strains, create a new strain and use our cross feature. What that will let you do is rename an umbrella strain that will then associate all the probes together so that you can run an, uh, all of those probes on the same sample for your first order. Why is that great? Well, you don't have to clip the same mouse twice to run an A for mutation, the first mutation, and then the second sample for the second mutation. You can actually cut the mouse or get a clipping from one mouse and run all of those probes for that mutation or for those mutations, sorry. And then next, if you're an expert user, if you're under my strains, create a new strain, say you have a transgenic model like a Cree. Well, you don't really need to go through the strain information process to go through the assay design um, review timeline. So what you could do is go to my strains, create a new strain from your probes. And as long as you have those probes in your inventory that you know that are associated to that mutation like Cree, you can automatically um, submit that strain, add that probe, and then it's instantly in your account. Another feature is our duplicate feature. Now this is for those users who kind of headline their account for other colleagues like postdocs, PIs, but they need to maybe separate those strains on the order because of different PO numbers or something of that sort. So what you would be able to do is use the same strain and rename it, but still have the exact same probe set and you're not having to go through the assay design process. So it's very instant and fast for you. And then lastly, you're more than welcome to use our strain sharing features. So you can either sh uh, share them independently or by bulk. If you do it independently, you need to go to my strains, click, of the, str uh, click the strain of interest, and then there's a tab that actually says uh, share strain, or yeah, share strain. And then you can click in the emails that you wish and then queue them and send it off. If you wanna do it in bulk, you would go to the blue taskbar in your quick order account, my strains, share strains, and then when that website or web page populates, there's a blue button that says share strains. Click that and it will populate all of the strains in your account. I do want to annotate that if you are a parent user, you'll be able to see all of the strains in all of the, all the accounts, even the sub users. If you're a sub user, you'll only be able to see the strains in your account, not in the parent user's account. So that's great. You have all of your strains in your account and you're ready to send your first order. However, let's talk about some best practices for validating those assays for those strains that you're about to submit to us. What we suggest and recommend is that go ahead, collect all of your samples and send them on the same plate. But when you're ready to place your first order, omit the large set samples that are not controls. Let's validate those assays on your controls first to ensure that you're getting the expected genotypes and expected results before 
testing all samples at once. Remember, Transgenetics does not have mice here, so we don't actually have controls for the actual mutation on hand. However, we do have over 100 internal quality checks during our processing. So controls are important, and let's talk about that a little bit. If you're on your My Strains page and you go to the strain of interest, there's a tab that says approved strain. And there's two parts to this. We'd like you to approve the probe, but also approve that specific strain with that probe set. Now here, they're all zero because an order hasn't been placed for those yet. But we would like you to see pluses and minuses for both of them. But that's also not only what we're asking, we're asking you to make sure that you're keeping up with your Mendelian ratios for that breeding. If your model is homozygote lethal, maybe you're not gonna get a negative for that wild type because they're always gonna be heterozygote or wild type, so you'll only get positives, and that's okay. What this is doing is allowing you to have a best practice to um, keep that schema and all of those results for, for that particular strain. So you would approve them and then say save changes. And this is also great for, say you, 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 know, you end up leaving the lab or transferring, there's another colleague that's in training. This is set up for them too, so that they, when they come in, they can be successful and see, hey, this probe is already approved. There's nothing left to do on this. And then we'll talk about how to um, also approve the strain as well. So once you approve your probes and make sure that you get the expected genotypes and Mendelian ratios for that breeding set for that strain, you'll then want to go to the approve strain button. Once you, so once you save the changes and approve your strain, a status will change. It'll say approved. This lets us know that everything is working for you, but it doesn't stop here for that strain. Say you have that cross that you made earlier. We want you to make sure that you're getting the expected genotypes for that probe set or that are assaying all of those mutations for you for the cross strain too. Why? Well, sometimes multiple mutations may have some similar uh, markers. Neomycin is one of them. We want to make sure that there's no cross reactivity with the probe sets that you're using for all of those mutations in that cross. So it's incredibly important to make sure you're maintaining your lines and your strains independently, whether it's the independent line or it's the cross strain. And then lastly, let's go over some action items. So sometimes there's going to be information that the assay designer requires for, from the user. So a strain may have requires more information. What does this mean? It means that the assay designer has deemed that there's um, information that needs to be reviewed and it's not sufficient for the assay design process. What I mean is maybe you just submitted a primer protocol. That primer protocol, again, may not be sufficient to proceed because we didn't get a hit in our database for that primer set. Or we just need further clarification. Maybe there's two pieces of information that are that are discrepant against each other. There's a discrepancy. The MGI doesn't match the paper. Um, you're talking about you want a SNP design, but it's actually some type of conditional model. So we may actually have to get back to you. Also, how, how can you actually respond? Well, we suggest you respond through the quick order account. If you contact us through an external, external source, like our chat feature, our email, um, you call us or contact like a sales rep, maybe they're, you know, they're out in the field, that's great, but it's going to delay the information getting back to the strain so that we can see, you know, your response. So we do ask that you um, reply back into the account, and I'll show you a snapshot in a second. And then once we get that response, we'll have 24 to 48 hours to review that and then either change the status to InDesign um, or maybe we reply back again. So this is the, um, the pop-up module that you'll see with the status of requires more information for that strain. If you click this hyperlink, it'll give you this module. Here's the information that the assay designer will write to you. You can use this text field to reply back. And then just remember, if you're submitting any documents to get to us for any clarity, um, remember to, to uh, push the attach file button. If you don't push this, the file will not send to us, unfortunately. So the last action item would be require sequence data. And as we suggested and talked about before, conditional models where there's flux, excision, marker deletions, we need that sequence data unless we already have that stock assay. Because that LOXP actually makes a secondary structure. So we try not to put a, a probe um, 
that reporter oligo in that secondary structure. And then we also need to know where those locks piece integrated so that we can design the wild type specifically as well. So the assay designer will request that. What that will do is send a request to your um, account. So we'll need a few things. We we'll either need a homozygote PCR product. What we would suggest is that you run the PCR product um, on a gel to make sure it's a strong, robust span and send us the other half of PCR product for us to sequence. Or you don't have a homozygote, that's okay. Run a heterozygote on a gel and cut out the mutant band. Lastly, if you don't run PCR in-house and it's the alternative issue or the alternative solution, you can run a, uh, you can send us a tissue sample that is a known mutant carrier. Now, please note that there will be a sequencing form and I'll show you that snapshot. So we'll need that product, one of those three products, and then the sequencing form filled out as well. And then depending on what sample you send us, that product may have to be um, prepped in-house. So if it's a gel, we have to extract the DNA. If it's a tissue, we'll isolate the DNA. If it's PCR product, um, that's perfectly fine. And then if you send us liquid DNA, please let us know in advance and that doesn't have any prepping as well. And then we'll send that to our third party vendors. And I do wanna mention that sequencing is at no cost to you. I, I forgot to mention that we also um, sometimes sequence for strain spe specificity. So if you do ask for a more strain specific assay, we may need to require the sequence data as well. So here's a snapshot of that sequencing request form. You will get a sequencing kit as soon as we request that data. Once you receive that kit, it'll have an Eppendorf tube with a blue cap with a, spe a specific barcode. That barcode um, will be submitted here. The sample name is however you prefer with your band sizes and primers, zygosity of the sample and your template type. Now if the template type you're sending, whether that's PCR product, tissue or liquid DNA or the gel cube, if that doesn't exist in this dropdown, please let us know so that we can update your form accordingly. Now, what if you have sequencing already? You don't need a sequence of sample. There's a checkbox up here that you can click and that will populate a new field. You can attach your files. Please remember to click this blue attach file button, or if you just have a copying paste feature, you can do that here. If you're going to attach files, please do not send any type of picture format. Um, JPEG, PNGs, any of that. You can send us SVD files, GenBank files, ABI files, text files, or you know just the typical Word or Excel. We can open those um, and, and manage those. Okay, so Transgenics uses qPCR with sequence-specific TACMAN assays for genotyping. We offer genotyping on most mutation models and can accept a variety of sample and species types. You can use our search feature for faster submissions, so that's searching our database for the constructs that we already have set up. We don't sequence in-house. We do use a third-party vendor, which requires a sample from you, and your primer sub set submitted on a form, as Stephanie just showed you, and this is all done at no cost, both the assay design and sequencing portions. And please validate your assays before submitting large orders. This helps us make sure that everything is functioning as expected. And for our assay process timeline, Stephanie is going to just kind of summarize this for us real quick. We didn't go over it, but I did want to mention that if you submit a, a strain information form, it goes through the process. It takes up to 72 hours for us to review it. It could take up to 10 business days just because we're still in high seasonal volume. Um, and then it does take um, possibly up to two weeks for manufacturing. And there are 10 of us on the team, um, even though three of us have only been able to talk with you today. Okay, so back to questions. So the first question that we've gotten is can we test for gene expression? And so what this actually is referring to is looking at the mRNA levels for a gene. And so the answer to this is no, we're actually testing DNA and not mRNA levels as you often do in qPCR. And so this is something that we come across fairly frequently as well. We're not able to assess the actual expression of a gene. We are just looking for its actual presence or absence in the DNA sequence itself. And so our next question is, can we test white blood cells? And the answer to that is yes, if you just do an RBC lysis um, on the blood and send the cell pellet in. Remember, um, we just need to be able to see a visible pellet, and that should be enough. Awesome. Um, our next question says, what if I need to genotype for the flux and excise? How do we let you know? That's a great question. And what we would suggest is you would submit a strain information form for the Floxton wild type. In the description in part two of that strain information form, you can just basically say 
I am looking to genotype for the flocks and wild type and we'll be sending another form for the excised and flocks. What we'll end up doing is ensuring that those are a little specific so there's no cross reactivity. And then if you did want to make, use our cross feature afterwards so that you can test for all three alleles in the same on the same sample, you can use that cross feature. So two strain information forms stating flocks and wild type and then EX and wild type and then using that cross feature to run all three assays on the same sample. And our next question says, can I test the same sample at different times or do I have to send new tissue? Um, actually, we can pull from your original sample three, up to three times, um, so three different orders. Um, the only exception would be liquid DNA. Um, liquid DNA, since it has to go through our automated process, we actually pull all of it to give us the best shot of recovering as much DNA as we can in the, in the one isolation process. So we can um, run liquid DNA once and your tissue up to three different times. We also store those samples up to six months. So say you want to use the same sample as a control or you want to use a different probe set later on because your research has finally gotten to that point. Just, rem um, just remember that we do store those at six months. If you do want, wish to extend that well plate storage, just contact us at help at transgenics.com and we can extend your storage for you at no cost. Great. So this will conclude our webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. Be on the lookout for future sessions this year. And of course, if you ever have any questions at all, feel free to email help at transmedics.com. We have a great customer solutions team that will help answer those questions as quickly as they can. And we also have um, 10 people on our genetic resolutions team. That's our team. And we'll be there to help as well. So feel free to reach out to us if you ever need anything.